Yeah, I've, I've solved it. All right, everyone. Good morning. I'm Brandon Rhodes, uh, not the author of Pandas at all. None of it is my fault. Um, but uh, as somebody who has had to learn to use it kind of a bit at a time, uh, as, as someone uh, who a year or two ago came at it uh, from a fresh start, um, I wanted to put together a tutorial that would tackle pandas in the order that I wish someone had explained it to me, uh, in an order that tries to build, uh, in a brief, the three-hour period that we have here, a basic set of ideas that will make you conversant with what Pandas does, how it works, so that as you then move to really, really fancy operations, you understand the basics of data manipulation and know what's going on. The uh, class here will be done in um, uh, sort of six segments. We'll do, uh, I've, I've divided the class material into, they aren't thick walls, are they? I'll just be loud. We, I've divided it into six segments that I will aim at making about a half hour a piece. And the, um, each of, wow. Okay, Brandon, concentrate. Uh, each session will be about a half hour, so there'll be three sessions, then the famous and much desired coffee break in the middle of the tutorial morning. I've heard of tutorial instructors running over the coffee break because they're so desperate to get through all their material. I'm told they often are not tutorial instructors again. And so I will make sure that I get us that um, uh, coffee break. Then we will reconvene after about 20 minutes and do our final three sessions. I have worked very hard to try to make sure you don't run out of exercises, even if you wind up being pretty good at pandas. And that means for many of you, you won't even get close during the 10 minutes or so I can off you, offer you during each session for doing exercises. You won't even get close to finishing. And that's fine. The goal of the number of exercises is to make sure you don't run out and feel that your time is wasted by having all the other nine minutes to just sit there twiddling your thumbs. I do not expect most of you to be able to complete all of them. Uh, look at the work I did to create the ones you don't finish as giving you a boost when you leave the tutorial. You get to go home and you'll still have some more challenges to try, some more material to get through. The, um, so that'll be the basic uh, format. In each of these uh, uh, chunks centered around one of these exercises notebooks, of which there are six, I will start by talking. At some point, I will then convince myself to stop, and you guys will go to work on the exercises. I'll circulate, I'll answer questions, I'll help out. And then finally, um, I'll come back to the front and try doing a few exercises in front of you uh, so that you can see what my solutions to them look like. Um, I don't know whether all of you were able to install Pandas based on the instructions in my uh, emails. When we hit the first exercise period, I and the TAs will try to help any of you for whom Pandas and the IPython notebook aren't running yet. The, um, so there will be chances to get that installed on. I'm very happy to report that as far as I can tell, the internet is working today, which is a really, really incredible accomplishment for, um, I, I don't know if you guys have been to tech conferences where the internet just falls over for the first day or two because of the number of people. Uh, the tutorial instructors in Atlanta at PyCon one year had to just run the first tutorial without internet. In case of that eventuality, I have put all of the Anaconda installers for all of the operating systems 
and all the course data and materials on these key fobs. And of course, in a, if, if all we had was, was local Wi-Fi, I could also bring up a web server on my laptop. So if, an ins if, if you have network or connectivity problems, then as soon as the exercises start, just tap me and I'll try to get you one of these keys so that you can maybe do an emergency local install from uh, uh, physical media and not just be stu stuck watching the people around you enjoy the uh, tutorial exercises. Um, there are, I don't think, um, any other points of order I want to cover. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, if you have lingering questions or install problems, I'll tackle them personally with you or, or our TA will when we start the exercises. I am going to go ahead and uh, first, uh, one thing I'll mention, the reason that I send you to Continuum IO's downloads page is that if, at least the last I checked, if you look up the Anaconda Python distribution, uh, really, really wonderful, I use it on Ubuntu. Even though Ubuntu has all this stuff packaged themselves, it's often almost six months old before the next version of Ubuntu comes out. Uh, and I find that if I, even on Ubuntu, which is famed for having up-to-date Python, uh, I would much rather have today's version of Pandas, uh, today's version of Matplotlib, the same ones that its authors are using and that scientists are using. And I find that it, it just all gets installed more quickly and works better if I use Anaconda. Um, my problem is that if I look up um, the Anaconda Python distribution, that the first link that comes up is not the downloads page, but is a page that rather unfortunately asks you to commit a privacy violation on yourself <laughs> if you want to download Anaconda. And you don't really need to. This is just a click through to that unprotected downloads page that you just saw me bring up directly from its URL. And I understand Continuum is a small consultancy that works with scientists in industry and academia, and they're used to having their email address asked for all the time, but I find it rather tacky, as well as I think a lot of programmers, professional programmers, find it a bit creepy. So if you're sending friends in the direction of this distribution, when you do the web search, click specifically on the downloads page, and you'll get Anaconda without them knowing your email address. The, um, so that's something important I always show uh, students uh, so that you don't think you have to give up your email address to get what is ostensibly free software. The um, other link I have here and that you also I think received an email is the zip file containing the uh, materials. The bandwidth seems to be pretty high in the internet connection they have here. So you can go ahead and be in, uh, downloading from either of those links while I get started here. Um, if you haven't installed yet and want to get started on that. All right. I have already started up the IPython notebook here on my computer, and I already have uh, my uh, notebooks loaded up and ready to go. Often when doing, I uh, don't know how, how much RAM you have on your travel laptops that you've brought with you, but I often find it's helpful before I start on a new notebook to go to the running tab and just shut down all of the notebooks that have kind of been left running from whatever my previous activity is. That can save RAM, prevent out of memory errors, put you in a better situation. I should note here that the, uh, I have just been alerted to the fact that even though the data files work for me on the system uh, that I, systems that I tried them on, uh, some of you using Python 2, and I support either Python 2 or 3 for this tutorial, nothing I'll type will be uh, spe specific to one or the other. Um, on my system, all these exercises work perfectly under both Python 2 and 3. It turns out that's because my system settings are so well configured. Uh, my system settings tell Python to expect all files, all text files, to be encoded in what's called UTF-8, 
Unicode encoding. It turns out that not all of you have systems that are so configured. If you get a Unicode decoding error when you run one of these from CSV data frames that tries to load data, all you need to do is tell it what um, I forgot to say explicitly in these notebooks, and I'll go edit them um, in the permanent class materials afterwards. You need to tell it, if you get any error, that the encoding is UTF-8. Because, as you can see from this first little bit of data, uh, actors, movie names, can have um, international characters in them, and so ASCII was not an option for this data set. Um, I'm going to be uh, using and encouraging you to use the uh, IPython notebook as your interface for this three-hour period. And so I will try to say a few, but only a few, because I don't want to go all day on the IPython notebook and, and cut time from our uh, uh, pandas learning, but I will mention a few things about how pandas works. The main ones are that it now has, if you installed a recent version, two different modes. Uh, one mode, all uh, typing or insert mode, you type characters and they appear on the screen. The other you get to, if you hit escape, you'll notice the cursor went away and you're now in not typing mode uh, where keys do something. For instance, if you accidentally hit X, it will delete the current cell that you're looking at. And by the way, when you execute a cell by hitting shift enter, you will note that it also takes the cursor away and now the X key will delete the next cell uh, because X is cut, uh, C is copy, and V is paste. For cells, just like control X, C, and V are normally cut, copy, and paste when you're editing. If you want to see all the shortcuts, you can hit the letter H for help. And it will bring up um, on your screen all of the notebook shortcuts. Um, It'll show you how to hit sh uh, shift enter in order to run a cell, control enter to run a cell and stay where you are rather than having it scroll you down to the next one, which can make it difficult to see the result. Um, and it will also, uh, among the other many commands that you'll want to learn if you get good at the IPython notebook, I will simply mention A and B because you'll see me using them a lot. A uh, inserts a new cell right above where you are. B inserts a new cell below. Very often when I'm starting a problem, you'll see me just adding some cells above and below where I currently am in order to give myself a little room to think and room to put ideas before I finally select the way that I'm going to solve a problem. Because I hope that one thing you'll see this morning is that using pandas effectively is a lot about exploration. It's trying things, looking at the results of an operation to see if it's got you closer to or farther from a data goal that you're trying to reach, uh, and being able to uh, very quickly create a few extra cells to play with ideas can uh, be a really important way of keeping clear about what you're doing. Um, so with that, I am going to, uh, I guess I just did it, but it's safe to do it again. I will shift enter, run that first cell. Matplotlib inline gives the plotting library permission to draw diagrams right in the notebook instead of popping up a separate image viewer, which I find annoying. And this second cell is interesting. I find notebooks, I have notebooks, I find pandas data frames to quite frankly be ugly. Um, it, it's not easy for my eye initially to see what is data and what is the framing around it. And so this cell is just for fun, you don't have to run it, but it loads up a pair of CSS style sheets that I've prepared, wraps them inside of a style tag, and then asks that HTML, which you'll see looks blank because it's a style sheet it's, it, uh, when it renders in your browser. But watch that IPython notebook when I run this cell. Sorry, watch that pandas data frame at the bottom when I run this cell. 
the CSS has just been brought into and made part of this HTML web page I'm looking at uh, with the result that the um, data frame is to my eye is a little easier to read. I've tried to better delimit the data part of the frame and I have tried to make the uh, index over to the left and the column names up at the top stand out a little better to my eyes. Uh, they look kind of yellowish on the slide. They look uh, a, a different color, uh, more of a pink on my screen. But either way, I just thought that to my eyes, having the backgrounds be different made it a little easier for me to see the difference the, when compared to um, uh, the, the fact that the normal data frame just uses bold for the labels and normal text for the middle. Almost all of our examples are just going to involve two data frames. Let me introduce uh, you to them. One is called titles.csv. It is simply a list of the name and the year of release of all of the major films in the Internet Movie Database. The second data frame has a uh, more interesting structure. And in fact, at the font size I've chosen, it just barely fits here um, horizontally. And again, remember, you'll want to say encoding equals UTF-8 if you have any problem loading it up. This uh, might have a given movie appear many times uh, because the title and year of the movie, to uniquely identify it, will occur once for each person who is listed in the credits for that movie. The information we have about them are the name, the type of role, whether they are an actor or actress. Uh, it is a simple binary choice. You have to be one or the other because of the Oscars. There's only two categories of, in most of the award ceremonies. And so um, even though human populations and human data sets uh, often would have to have a, a, a quite a spectrum of choices there. Uh, in Hollywood, it's by definition a role is play, you either play it as an actor or an actress, a much more uh, limited uh, data set there. I'm suddenly reminded of that line that the head player says in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead when, when Rosencrantz or Guildenstern uh, calls the head player, says something about you people, and the head player brings himself up and says, people, we're not people, we're actors, we're the opposite of people. The, uh, so actors uh, and actresses fall into a simple binary uh, classification for the purposes of databases. What character did the person play? And then, it, it, it turns out there's, there's this huge question of who comes first, who comes second, who comes third when you list the people that were in a movie, and that is this last column uh, in. Uh, I am going to skip all of the questions, which you'll be working on in a moment. Uh, go down to the bottom here, hit B to get some uh, extra cells and not distract us. And we'll kind of start fresh down here. And I will quickly show you uh, five or six features of the data frame that are all you will need to get started on the first set of exercises. I deliberately made the first set of exercises simple questions that require only a few actions, only a few verbs for you to know, so that you can get your fingers on the keyboard early here. Uh, and so I don't wind up explaining everything about pandas before you get the chance to touch your keyboards. Um, when we start the exercises, I'll bring up a little cheat sheet of, of the names of the maneuvers so you don't have to uh, memorize or be scribbling things down. Uh, and I should note that I did go ahead and throw into the course materials the solutions. If you want to and you think your time will be better spent as you look at a hard problem, you can open the solutions notebook for that same, you know, one or two or three or four and, and go ahead and see how I solved one of the problems if it's really stumping you. Uh, but so here, very quickly, a few basic things we can do. If you simply mention the name of a notebook and hit enter, 
then not the whole notebook will display. Look what's right in the middle. And this is one of the great things about a professional data library versus uh, more primitive data types with print. Pandas knows that I do not want to see this entire data frame on the screen at once. I don't know what Chrome would do if I gave it 306,000 rows, but it would take a while, whatever it did. And pandas, if you ask for something dangerous, like, let's look at all of the rows, let's just look at this table, notice that what it does is it, in fact, shows you an excerpt. It shows you the first few rows, it then shows you uh, ellipses, and then maybe the last 20 rows or so. This is the second maneuver. As you saw, I can take the len of it, just like I would a uh, list or a tuple or other basic Python data structure. I can find the number of rows. Now, it's usually fairly uh, distracting if this much data, what, 40 rows of data, appear to the screen or written to the screen every single time, I just want to be reminded of what the columns are. You'll, you'll see, typically, when I'm solving a problem, the very first thing I do is just want to remind myself, what columns does this data frame have? And a much more convenient way to do that is to ask for fewer rows, to explicitly ask for a subset of the data frame by saying head to get the first five, tail to get, do you notice what just happened? That was distracting. Now, I had scrolled so that the data frame would be visible to you. I then said, hey, let's switch from looking at the tail to looking at the head. Ah! And all of a sudden, like I was moved up half a page and the data frame is now only partly visible down at the bottom of the page. Anyone know what just happened? Then it's a good thing you're in the pandas tutorial. What happened is if you'll watch, we'll do it again, when you hit shift enter or control enter to run the current cell, normal enter you'll note just lets you type. You have to combine enter with shift or control to get something to happen. When I hit control enter, the IPython notebook is going to throw away the previous output because it's no longer current. With this element gone from the DOM of my notebook, there's not this much page left anymore in my browser. And Chrome, not wanting to show me blank space off the bottom of the document will helpfully scroll me up to keep the document in view. A few milliseconds later, pandas gets done running the dot head, gives me the result, and now it's sitting at the bottom off the screen. So watch, I'm going to do it again. One, two, three. It disappeared, so Chrome moved me up in the document, since there now wasn't as much material at the bottom, and then it almost immediately got filled back in. That is why I love the B key. What does the B key do? Exactly. So I do this. Ah, paradise. Watch this. Run the cell. Run it again. Run it a third time. Ah, oh, always do that. Give, give yourself a lot of blank cells so that your browser doesn't keep warping you around uh, from one part of the document to another because um, it'll drive you crazy. Let me emphasize that dot .head and dot .tail are real, genuine data operations. Dot .head doesn't just show you the first five rows or the first... 10 rows, or the first um, eight rows. What it does is it really builds a new data frame. You can use this to reduce a large data set if you've sorted the rows you're interested up to the top. You can use head and tail to snip off the most interesting first few or last few entries in a data frame. So even pandas 
head and tail operations that you use to just get a little data on the screen are actually real data slicing powerhouses that uh, are actually very, very useful when you're almost done with data reduction and you know you only need the top few results. If you save this to a data frame, I'll call it H, then you can uh, ask for it later. You can run head on it again to get a smaller piece. It is a fully functional data frame, just like titles was, and it just happens to have a slightly smaller length. Uh, and so you will see me use that as a final data reduction step. Another trick you'll notice that I use is if I'm going to be doing several things to a data frame in a single um, cell, I'll often give it a name, have a few lines of um, operations that I do on it, and then you can put print, but the result will typically be kind of ugly, boxy, plain text. Remember, if the last thing in a frame in an IPython notebook is simply the name of something you want to look at, then without you even having to spend time typing in print, you will get to see the results there on the page. So this is how I'll set cells up when I'm doing problems. There are uh, only two basic operations I'll show you here, and then you'll get started, uh, besides head and tail and length. One is filtering. Let me here ask for the head of titles. Uh, what filtering does is it um, lets you reduce a data frame to only the rows that match some criterion. And the way that you do this is interesting. It surprised me when I started. Because what you do is you first have to learn that these columns are called series. When they're in the data frame, they're called columns. But when you just pull them out, you have a series. And you can do that in one of two different ways. Um, if I, uh, you know, let's, let's use my little tiny data frame here. We'll return to using only five columns so that it's not too big for my screen. If you say H, and you could either use square brackets to look up one of the columns and return it as a series. So this is the series of um, uh, titles. You can also say here if you want to get uh, the other column. The, um, and aren't those ugly, by the way? Isn't that just terrible? I always feel like pandas is just mad at me when I create a series. Even though you need to create series all the time, they're so ugly I just feel like I've done something wrong and I'm looking at the, the low level guts of what's happening inside of pandas, but it's, it's really just that they kept it simple because it could be simple. Um, it's, uh, they've so far invested their time in interesting rendering for data frames, but this is still, this little series with just, in this case, the years in it, is a very important uh, kind of object, and watch what we can do with it. Just like with NumPy, this uh, object lets you do math as though you're operating on just one number, and it will go touch them all. So I could say, give me the year plus 10,000. And watch this. I will get back five numbers that are each of those years plus 10,000. I can say minus 10,000 and get out some negative numbers uh, to be a little more useful. If I'm interested, let's say, in looking at different decades, I could divide by 10 using that special Python operator for truncating division, the uh, double slash. Think of the double slash as the first slash doing the division, and then the second slash is like this samurai sword that chops off the um, fraction after the number. So if I double slash 1923, I just get the one nine and the two. If I then repair the damage by multiplying the result by 10, you'll note that I'm very able, easily uh, able to turn years into decades, which might or might not be important when you start the exercises here in a moment. Now, it should have been obvious to me, and, and, and interestingly enough, it wasn't. Someone had to show this to me. It should have been obvious to me that if I can get a column, and by the way, if the column's name doesn't have any spaces or special characters, 
you can also access the column in most cases with um, a simple attribute lookup, dot year. Uh, that doesn't work if it happens to collide with the name of one of the data frame's native attributes or methods. But data frames by default have nothing called year, so I'm safe. And uh, though I could always type it this way, uh, for the sake of, of speed this morning, I will often refer to columns by just dot and their name. That's why I often choose column names that are lowercase, don't have spaces, and don't have special characters, because then I get to access them with attribute lookup. Now, we've seen that I can do math with this. What was less obvious to me is that this is also a math operator. Greater than is something that you can do. Let's say, we'll say 1985. Now, doing division, whoops, in Python, normally returns another number. What does greater than return in Python? So if doing math gave me five numbers, doing comparison will give me five true or falses. Exactly. Um, and so if I ask whether the year, notice that I often just back up and comment out what I've just written if I want to review. So if I ask which of these years are after 1985, it turns out almost all of them. So I get a column of almost all trues. The fact that you can get a big column full of booleans might not seem very interesting until I tell you that the other thing that we will do this morning with this square bracket, operation number one, again, was give it the name of a column, you get the column out. The other thing we'll learn this morning with the square bracket is that if you give the square bracket operator on a data frame a big, big list of trues and falses, it says, what is this? It is a big list of trues and falses. They must correspond to the rows that Brandon wants. And so you get out just the four rows that succeed because they're greater than 1985, or the one row that's less than 1985, uh, and so forth. Um, I was very confused the first time I saw this expression on uh, a, a tutorial. I'm like, Python can't do that h square bracket, and then some kind of condition? The world doesn't work that way. I didn't, I, I, like, like, I, it looked like a syntax error the first time I saw it, but it's not. It is a comparison that instead of giving you a single true or false that you might throw at an if statement, it's a comparison that returns an array of true or falses that you're using to uh, do filtering that you're using to do selection. One problem, if we simply uh, hated 1980s movies, you might think that we could do this and say, uh, give me all of the movies where it's either before 1980 or uh, after 1990. And if any of you have tried this before, you know that your reward for typing that is a horrible exception the truth value of a series is ambiguous. Reason here is that AND is a hard-coded, built-in Python operation that does one thing and one thing only. It asks its left argument to become a true or false, and then might move on and ask the same thing of the right-hand argument. AND h dot year less than 1980 isn't a single true or false. It has some trues in it and some falses. So the AND operator is just confused. Read the message again. The truth value of a series is ambiguous. The series can't give AND a single true or false decision because it's full of both kinds of answer. So what pandas had to do here, because you can't override the keywords AND or OR in Python, is they needed an operator, a operator that they could override and it turns out Python has one. And this is actually a very good idea because ampersand means bitwise and, and that's really what we're doing here, right? We're getting a list of true falses, a list of bits, and we're putting them together with another list of bits. Only problem is operator precedence. Python thinks of this as something you do to numbers, 
before you run any comparisons on those numbers. So if I leave it like this, it's going to do 1980 and h.year first, and then try to uh, get that Boolean uh, operation, that bitwise operation, compared to these outer numbers, which isn't what we mean at all. So the only, the only time in Python I ever really need to use a lot of parens is when I'm using and, uh, and its friend or, which in computing is traditionally the vertical pipe symbol. Well, that's confusing pandas. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, IPython notebook, because it's, it's helpfully putting my um, comments in italics. I can't tell whether that's a slash or a pipe character. If you want, or there, now it looks vertical. And then pipe character. I'll have to comment that out for just a second here as I run this and show you that, oh, you can't be before 1980 and after 1990. You have to be one or the other. And so here, I'm able to knock the 1980s movies out. And that's why the syntax is the way it is. Operator precedents would normally try to do the or between these two numbers before attempting the comparison. One final thing you'll want to know how to do is when you have selected some columns that you're interested in. So let's say, um, let's ask for the titles. Actually, I'm not going to type that much. I often, at the very top of a data frame, just give a nickname to each thing, or at the top of a, a cell, I give a nickname to each thing I'm going to be talking about. So here, I'm going to uh, call this um, T. And what I will do is I'll say, let's grab uh, where the name equals Macbeth, and it tells me that the data frame has nothing called a name. Practice this today. People have names. Movies have titles. I always get those confused. Here are all of the Macbeths, but they come out of the IMDB flat file in a pretty random order. So the other thing that you'll often want to do is to sort. Uh, happily enough, there is a method on the data frame called sort and you just give it the name of the column you want to sort by. So here, if I say sort by year, I get uh, the 19 teens movies first and the upcoming 2015 version of Macbeth, didn't know that was coming out, last. And of course, what you'll probably really want to do is either be interested in what were the first few Macbeths and do a head, or what are the most recent Macbeths and do a tail. Yes, sir. That's interesting. I will put that, I'll have you write that down in a second, and I will put it on the screen. Those are the basic maneuvers, and I have them here in a little cheat sheet for you. Length of a data frame, the head or tail, the two different syntaxes for pulling a column, uh, the fact that you can just do plain old math on every item in a series by adding it to a constant, um, or all the other math operators work too, uh, or adding it to another series. Um, the, I'll cover these three uh, in a few, uh, I'll cover them now. Uh, up here in the upper right, I show two, three examples of filtering with both an and and or. Uh, sorting. These two series operations um, I don't think are strictly necessary, but in case you wind up getting out one of those series, and remember, that's what you get out if you just mention dot year. That's a series. The um, three things you might want to do is first, you might be interested in sorting them. Oddly enough, that is not called dot sort on a series. Dot sort will not give you uh, a useful result at all. It's called dot .order. And that's an, uh, they're, they're hoping to get rid of that asymmetry in the next version of pandas. But for right now, you order a series, but you sort a data frame. Uh, and then these other two tests are for uh, cases 
where you get a null value. You saw a null value, I think, briefly when we looked at the cast list because some people are important enough that their entry in the cast list has one of those numbers in, like four or nine. They are important in the list of cast members, but not everybody is that fortunate. Uh, some people are just down in the, the sort of the extra credits at the end. They're on that second page on the IMDb you have to go to. If you're looking at a data frame like this and you don't want to compare in to 10 or 20 or 30, but you just want to know, is it a number at all? Uh, is it one of these not a number floating point values or not? You can say is null. Um, oh. Of course, I, I want, uh, I, what I meant to do was to filter this. How do we filter? By using square brackets. H, give me your N series and tell me, please, whether it is not null. Why did nothing happen? This is going to happen to me a dozen times today. In Python, merely evaluating an expression does not change the value. What I just did is this x equals 10, x plus 20. What will display for x when I hit control enter here? 10. Merely computing the value x plus 20 doesn't do anything unless you save it to a name, right? The two cells here are exactly synonymous. The first cell sets x to an object. The second cell computes something and throws it away per completely normal Python. This has doubtless happened to you guys in scripts before. And then I'm asking to see the first thing again. Here, I ask for the head of the cast table. Here, I computed a really interesting subset result from it and threw it away. And then here, I was shocked and dismayed to look at what H stood for. I was shocked that it still stood for what I set it to the last time I set it. When, if you're, you're doing this style I do, where I tend to do little steps one at a time, uh, you do have to remember when you spin up a new data frame, this is going to be a little three-line data frame, I think, uh, do remember to save it so that you can see it when you're done. So here, I'm grabbing the cast members who were lucky enough to have an in that is not null, and here I will grab the ones that are, alas, more lowly, and that uh, are null. So that completes everything you need for the first set of examples. And it sounds like I now go get to play with windows and encoding errors. I'll be back in a few minutes. Have a good time. And raise your hand if you need help. Let me check on the encoding. Recommendation I gave that you simply, uh, remember I had this uh, idea that you could just come up to your uh, from CSV lines and uh, just set the encoding manually. It's working for a lot of people, but some people's systems are then, after loading successfully, refusing to display this little HTML table because they are not comfortable making its output UTF-8. So I am told, and a gold star to whoever came up with this. This is uh, above and beyond for a pandas tutorial, uh, or, or whoever searched for it on Stack Overflow or whatever. Still, <laughs> gold star. Um, import sys, reload sys, and then use its uh, magic set default encoding. If you do this at the top of each notebook, I'm told that you can then load and save uh, load and display all of this information without a problem. And raise your hand if you have special problems I need to address. All right, I'm going to uh, go back into talking mode uh, because, as I said, my goal here was to leave you guys with exercises to do when you go home. Uh, I knew that three hours is a limited amount of time, and I didn't want you to... Um, uh, get out of here and, and not have any next steps. So the, um, uh, I'll understand if you keep typing because you're uh, enjoying exploring. 
but let me quickly show you a few more tricks that if you're interested, will let you go ahead and dig into some of the exercises in the exercises two um, folder. Folder, it's not called a folder. Notebook. All right, I'm scrolling down to the bottom, hitting B several times to give myself some room. The first frustration that people often have is they don't just want to get, let's say, the um, uh, titles directory and uh, answer pure equality questions. Uh, don't just want to ask whether the title equals equals Hamlet, but they want to know maybe whether the movie has Hamlet uh, in the name at all or whether it starts with the word Hamlet. Uh, those are things, uh, if we wanted the length of the title, if we wanted to know if it started or ended with a particular term, we normally would just uh, call a string method on that string by itself. We would say, uh, you know, if there was a movie called Hamlet uh, with that little uh, notation the IMDb uses to distinguish several movies of the same name released the same year, um, it would be really neat to be able to just say, well, I don't care whether you are the string Hamlet, I just care whether you start with the string Hamlet. Uh, and it, they thought about, I mean, the possibility was there of getting um, a series like uh, this uh, C. Title series. Uh, there was the possibility of just attaching all of the string methods to it. Why not give the series starts with? Why not give the series ends with? Why not give it all the powers of a string? Uh, the problem is that some of the string method names collide with methods that you would like a series uh, to be able to support, so they made a compromise. Do I still have my little, yeah, I have a little, uh, let's take this tiny data frame here. Uh, this is h.title, and alas, it does not have a starts with T-H-E. It does have a little namespace attached to it called str that does have aggregate versions of every single string operation. So with um, this being our little data frame, this is the true and false test of whether these titles started with the word the. And you'll find that you can do um, string dot uh, length. You can do ends with, you can do contains. Uh, there's a lot of basic string operations. And if you get interested in playing while you're here today or later, I, I, my favorite part of the Pandas documentation is the API reference. Uh, I recommend that you all I'll put that URL in our um, slide that I bring up next. But if you can go here, don't, I find it's not very useful to uh, hit control F and then just type in like str. That's not going to bring me to the string operations because uh, simply typing str in my web browser is fine. It's just going to take me to every place that a word has the letters str next to each other. So what I do is this, dot str dot. There is only one place on this page that you will find str with dots on both sides, and it's a quick way to get down if you're interested and see all of the string methods that are supported in pandas. Uh, but length and starts with are the only ones you need for exercise two. Um, second trick that I want to go ahead and show you is that sometimes you're interested in a series in how many times each value appears. For example, if I look at titles.year, okay, that's great. It's like more than 300,000 years. But I know that each, I know that the total number of years that appear there is not 300,000. And there's a neat little method called value counts, which, mm -hmm, value counts, which goes through a series, figures out how many times each value appears, and pairs it with its frequency. Uh, and this lets us see that in 2013, there were 8,696 movies. And what you get back is a normal series that does all the normal things. You can ask for its head. You can ask for its tail. 
Uh, you can uh, uh, confine your attention to the most frequent or the least frequent items uh, by simply snipping off the top or bottoms. Um, the uh, something fun that you can do is that if you have, whenever you have a series like this with an index and a value, you can ask pandas to plot it. That means to bring up a, a grid and start drawing lines between each successive point. And the result looks like this. Say that again. That's great, you're my ear for the rest of the class. <laughs> what happened? What went wrong? Okay, it's transposed. It decided to put the years right to left. What's another problem? It's not year sorted. It is, now watch, watch this. If I just want to, and I often do this, I get a, conf a result that's confusing, so I just go put a, a, a hash sign. I just put a comment character to back up one step and say, okay, how is this sorted? And the answer is it's sorted by the frequency. I mean, it just so happens that because the number of movies made each year is always increasing recently, we might, from glancing at the top of this data frame, think it's sorted by year. You really can't tell. But if you go back to a time period when the number of uh, movies fluctuated, you can see that, for instance, the number of movies that have been announced or rumored, sorry, for 2017 uh, or for 2020, is all mixed in with the number of movies made and produced in 1898. That must have been fun. It's Oscars for everyone. <laughs> the, um, and so, because this is ordered by frequency, if you plot it, the line is going to follow the frequency counter. It'll jump back to the 1800s, and then it'll have to draw a line over the, the 2000s, and then back to the 1800s, and it's a mess. What we've got to do is we want to get this sorted, and we've already seen how to sort uh, data with a dot .sort or dot .order, but we're now in an interesting situation. We want to sort this thing that we haven't talked about much yet, the thing over on the left, which up here is just line numbers from the file that we read in, and over here is years. We can use dot .sort or dot .order to sort data, what is this thing to the left? And so this is the moment when I get to introduce you to the concept of the pandas index. That's the yellow thing on your screens, the pink thing over to the left. Uh, the index gives you a way to do, as we'll see later, quick lookups of data. You tend to put the information that you're using to look things up on the left and then keep the, the, the main data over to the right, and all I need to show you to the, at the moment is that while sort or order targets the data, sort index is the special maneuver that gives you a horrible error. Why did it give me a horrible error? Because I tried to sort index on plot. So let's um, get rid of plot for now. Okay, so I now have value counts dot sort index and look, it just ignores the fact that 1899 had fewer movies in 1898. They are now strictly in order from 1894 all the way up to 2024. And I can say dot sort index and plot. And now we get a fairly nice little plot of the um, uh, movies made over movie history. Um, there's other kinds of plots you can do. One quick one is that if we get the cast, uh, and I accidentally hit a special keystroke that I learned this week, sends me over to another browser window. All right, so I can bring up the uh, cast and glance at the top of it. I wonder, how important is Kermit the Frog? How has his in value bounced up and down? How often is he top credits? How often is he near the bottom? Well, you'll already know from the exercise that you've just been doing that I can say Kermit the Frog if I want to pull 
all of the instances, remember this is, this just doesn't look like his full career, that's because I'm just running head on it to glance at the first five results of Kermit the Frog. Uh, what I can do is you can, instead of, uh, uh, you saw by default dot plot looks at the index and the value in order to pull out the X and Y, but if you don't want to bother with moving data over into the index, you can just say, hey, when you plot, let's choose the year column for the x value. Let's choose n, which remember will be worse as it gets bigger, because it's better to be the number one. And um, there's a, uh, if you look at the documentation, there are a lot of different kinds of plots. This is uh, uh, the, the default one where it connects everything with a line. Uh, a scatter plot instead does dots. So we see something interesting. I, Kermit's career has, has, has moved very much towards the middle. Back in the early, early days, he was both getting quite terrible parts, like uh, looks like he was 18th in the cast of some movie, but in those same years, he was like also... I mean, he was the leading frog in many movies. And more recently, he has kind of fallen from that. He's been getting fewer roles, and a lot of them have been kind of, honestly, kind of mediocre. Poor Kermit. Poor Jim Henson. That's true. Thank you. Um, so those are some um, uh, basic maneuvers to, to be able to look at uh, pictures rather than numbers, which will make the next uh, set of exercises more pleasant for you. Uh, and then finally, if you ever just find a um, table a little, and I hit that keystroke again, if you ever find a table just a little too busy and you really only care about, let's say, the year and the n value, we've, we've seen two things with square brackets so far. We've seen being able to look up one column. We've seen being able to do filtering. If you want more than one column, then where you would put a single string in quotes, put a list of strings in quotes, and you'll get out only those columns. So with uh, those few uh, tricks here, the fact that you have dot stir operations that you can do, the fact that you can do value counts and sort index, and then a whole little passel of plot operations, you are ready, if you want to start uh, looking at the Exercise 2 notebook, to try some of those operations and getting more into graphics. So I'll let you guys go. On that, we'll work for about 10 minutes before, um, and uh, soon the uh, coffee hour will be coming up. So I will go check on the time of that and make sure we break and make it to the coffee before it's out. So get started. All right. Before the scones are gone, it is time for a break. Uh, I'm told that we have 15 minutes for our coffee break, so let's open the doors wide, mill around, talk amongst yourselves, meet each other, have coffee, have some food, and I'll see you back here at 15 till the hour. Buddy, welcome back. You did a really, really great job of cleaning those tables off. I mean, from right here, all I see is a black tablecloth and nothing is left. Um, so uh, gl glad that the coffee break went well. Um, I'm going to loop back around here and uh, talk for another few minutes now. As uh, and, and we'll find by, the, by design this um, tutorial moves more towards my talking and a little away from exercises here in the second half. Uh, partly because uh, our time is limited. You guys, I know, have each made an investment in order to be here today. And I mean, without, I hope without risk of, of uh, don't, don't, don't want this to sound wrong, but I think you did show up to hear me talk today not to spend most of your time confused and, and staring at your own screen. Um, so I tried to front load this tutorial with a lot of exercises, a lot of minutes on the keyboard, because I believe that even those few minutes that you've spent so far trying to get things to work 
and, and doing some operations have given you that familiarity that now in the second half will let me do more talking, where you now have a bit of a feel for what I'm talking about when uh, I, I start doing filtering and doing operations. So we'll still follow the same pattern, talking a few minutes for exercises, but the emphasis will now be more on the talking now that you're set up and working, now that I know that most of you can, whenever you want, try typing in something uh, that you see on my screen to see if it works for you. So, session three involves really beginning to pay attention to indexes. We glimpsed them briefly in the previous segment uh, when we didn't know how to get a, um, a value counts sorted properly. You remember what happened? We did a value counts, and it ranked the years by uh, uh, most to least uh, number of movies. We then said plot and got a disaster because the um, series was ordered by its data rather than by its index, and that gave us um, an excuse here to learn the dot sort index operation so that we could get the index over to the left sorted rather than the data on the right. The uh, index, however, is a very general purpose tool. It is not intended just as, as some, uh, you know, an annoying feature that you have to learn how to sort if you want your plots to look good. Its intention is to organize your data and to provide you fast access to it. I'm going to start with that second point. The index lets you get to data much more quickly than you could otherwise. I'm just going to illustrate this for you, so pay attention. I don't have any exercises uh, for, for the reason that indexes take a little while to build. And when I tried running, I did some. I did. I wrote some exercises about indexing, and I ran through them, and they were just miserable. You spend your time sitting there waiting for indexes to build. Then you do a lookup, and oh, it's fast. Then you wait for another index to build. And that didn't seem like a good use of your time in the last minutes here. So instead, I will just do uh, this feature of indexes, the fact they make things fast, um, here myself. So watch this. I always start, before I do anything, by running dot head. So I have there on the screen the names of the columns that I'm interested in. I want to get the cast of every movie named Sleuth. So, uh, title equals Sleuth will be a list of trues and falses. Throw those at the cast and I should get out the complete cast of the two movies called Sleuth, all mixed together, but what can you do? Well, <laughs> what can you do? You can sort. But we won't because we're um, thinking of something else at the moment, which is how long did this lookup take? Because it just had to go through, what, 300,000 rows? No, more than that. Um, I'm thinking of the wrong table. What is the len of cast? 3.7 million rows. I'll round up to four because I like to sound impressive. So we just went through four million rows. And by the way, this is why people use Python. You write equals equals, and for that investment in typing, you get four million comparisons done. Boom. That's why people use pandas, because it lets you say a single thing and have it apply to an entire data set. I said equals equals. Um, roughly 3.7 million falses came out, and it looks like about a dozen trues, and then that was used to index into cast. How long did that take? There's a nice little special you can do. Specials are little codes that you put at the top of an IPython notebook cell with a double um, percent sign in front of it. There's one called time. Don't use the one called time it. The one called time it runs the cell at least four times, which if it's an expensive data operation means you're waiting like several minutes. And it doesn't, if I recall, put the results out in your main namespace. So it's just bad all around, avoid it. Instead, use time, 
which runs a normal operation, but then tells you in a little report how long it took so that you can compare against different uh, approaches that you're thinking of, which are more and less efficient. So here we got, let's do it a few times. We're getting uh, about half a second, a little under half a second in order to do almost four million comparisons, which isn't bad. I've taken longer to do four million comparisons before. I'm not gonna complain. Someone at, Python, uh, at PyCon has a watch that doesn't show minutes. They just have an hour hand because they don't want to be tied to, you know, the specific minute. So cast.setIndex title is a new operation. SetIndex is an operation that lets you clobber and replace, in this case, the line number of the file that you read data in from. If we say set index title, why did nothing display when I just hit control enter? It is saved to C. This is what I need to do if I want to both create and see this result. And look what's happened. Those big line numbers are gone. And this is the first of several um, big operations that we'll learn in the second half that move entire columns around in your data frame. In this case, look for the title column. It's gone. Title column isn't there anymore. Oh, there are no titles in the blue data area. Instead, we have ask for a new data frame in which title has been transformed into the index. So, um, um, it's really hard to scroll and there's so many things on the screen, so let's just do a dot head to glance at the result. And the rule is this, once you have indexed, there is a little, um, uh, a special, th there's actually like half a dozen of these and we're not gonna learn them all. This is the only one I show you today, in the interests of time and confusion, keeping confusion at a minimum. Dot loc, meaning uh, look at a particular location, lets you specify a key. Think of uh, once you've created an index, once you've put useful data in the index, you're almost in the situation of a Python dictionary where you now have set an interesting key by which you can do square bracket lookup. And so I can look up sleuth and out comes uh, now again, with the title as now part of the index, out comes that same um, collection of the cast from the two different versions of the movie. Now, you probably saw that it took a moment to do that, and you probably started to wonder, what's the point of an index if it just moves me from a half second to a quarter second? I mean, obviously, um, Pandas has done something behind the scenes here, in order to uh, make the index look up a bit faster, but it's still not that fast. It's still not that impressive. And the answer is an index only really helps pandas out if it's ordered. Because it's when an index's values are in order that it can just jump into the middle and say, all right, this is the letter M. I'll bet sleuth is down lower than this. Then it can jump down there and say, all right, now I'm in the middle of the T's. I guess I need to go back a little. And it can very quickly, using a, what's a, 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 a divide and conquer search algorithm, it can very quickly zoom in on the little area where the rows are named sleuth without having to search uh, all um, four million of them. And so right now we're getting about 224 milliseconds let us get this operation with which I created this. Let's do this again a little differently. I'm going to set index title, which again is completely out of order. The core comes first. Great choice, IMDB. And let's do that same operation that we did earlier when we wanted our graph to display properly. Let's do a sort index so that all of the films that begin with the ASCII character hash mark will come first, 
and I suppose all the ones that start with various international characters will come last. We now have the entire, notice how long that took, and that's why we're not having you guys do a bunch of exercises on indexing. You have to sit and wait while the index gets sorted. But I now have a version of cast where the titles are in order, so if I want to look up Sleuth, it takes freaking forever. That's just because it was loading back in. So much RAM got used during that operation that I think some of it um, paged out. Let's try again. One millisecond. 900 microseconds. So right around a millisecond. So I've got an operation uh, sped up by about 500 times here. It's gone from half a second to about a thousandth of a second in the amount of time that it takes to pull this. And so suddenly, it's very fast. Notice, boom, the cast of Star Wars. Um, Wizard of Oz, boom. I'm pulling casts out much, much faster than I can type them because I invested that expense of getting the index created and sorted. And then, uh, especially if I've built an application or if I'm doing repeated queries into a huge data set, I wind up saving an immense amount of time because of that initial investment. Something we haven't seen yet is that indexes don't just have to have a single column in them. You can dump multiple columns over into that index. So uh, in this case, uh, of course, we're seeing um, multiple versions of Sleuth, multiple versions of the Wizard of Oz. Let's bump both title and year over to the left-hand side so that I now have an index with two levels. This is interesting because if I say sleuth, then I still have a little index left. So look here. I now have a two-level index. My first lookup by selecting the entry here where the title is sleuth pulls that off and returns a data frame to me that still has a second index attached, the year. I can either uh, then look in that index to get 19, I can't. What is it? I need to say dot loc. Remember, if I do square brackets, it's expecting a column name or one of those big true falses. It is dot loc, just as I did here, that lets you do an, a lookup in your index. So here, uh, again, very, very uh, small runtime. I'm able to grab Sleuth uh, 1972. You are also, by the way, allowed to look in the index uh, all the levels at once. Instead of asking for a data frame and then looking in that, you can, in good Python style, just pass all at once all of the levels of index you want to provide and get out in a single lookup round um, Sleuth 1972. Uh, here I am going ahead and saying grab this and then while you're in there, while you're already busy with that index, don't stop and build a Sleuth data frame. Go all the way in and build me a Sleuth 1972 data frame. Uh, very important here, so that you stay oriented. Um, I want to show you how to go back. The way to go backwards is to say, so if we got into this situation of having an index by saying set index, what, in computing, what's the opposite of set? It is reset. The, um, and that's the, uh, for some reason, the traditional opposite of set. I remember being confused by that as a kid, that set and reset on my color computer were the opposites of each other. But you can do a reset index. Let's, once we've made, um, actually, let's, 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 let's do this to our um, Sleuth uh, data frame here. So I will cut and paste this. Let's uh, get this. So we're gonna look up Sleuth and then reset the year. So this got a data frame that had title and year in the index, and it's tossing the year back out so that it becomes data again. You could filter by it. You could do other things like that. 
you can reset the title instead and keep the year on the outside. Uh, and then finally, as you will probably guess from the pattern that you've seen already, uh, almost any pandas operation that takes a column name is also perfectly happy to be given a series of titles. And in this case, um, we, we completely evacuated the um, index of any useful information, so pandas had to step into the gap and invent one for us. Uh, and because it's part of the Python ecosystem, it started with zero. Um, because I uh, won't have, um, I, I invite you later as you're playing with pandas and learning more to, um, uh, to experiment with the way fast lookup works with .loc, but since I won't really be uh, giving you any assignments on this, I, I need to ask, do you, have, uh, do you have any questions about this? You first. It, so yes, uh, so the question was, uh, are there data types that are particularly, particularly good for indexing? Uh, yes, uh, as the last exercise, we'll talk a little about data import and data type, so remind me if I don't get to it then uh, to, to relate that back. But um, in general, getting good specific data types, like treating numbers as numbers rather than strings, is good whether you are doing indexing, or even if you're just doing that double equal sign, even if you're just doing the filtering we've done, that's going to be faster if you have the simplest possible data type there. An integer rather than a float, a float rather than a string. I haven't the faintest idea. So the the um, so I'm getting forty. Let's try. Maybe it isn't here. Forty five milliseconds for this. I'm I am getting slightly faster for the two parter. I have no idea. Um, I I know that this is such a small data set compared to what pandas usually tackles that just the if statements it's doing to decide what I've passed it. Um, are, are, are a possibly, possibility of an issue here, because one decision it has to make is, well, for instance, are the indexes here tuples? Maybe I have an index of real Python tuples and I'm trying to grab one of them. And so I expect here that some of the if statements, some of the little thinking it's having to do to decide what I mean by a tuple is what's adding those uh, milliseconds, um, but I don't know for sure. And alas, I'd love to dig in and find out, and I'll be doing that after the class, but I lack the time at the moment. Yes, sir. An, uh, a sorted index helps look up. If you want to do something to every item in the index, they still all have to be okay, visited. So As f so in many cases, having an ordered index won't matter. But, I mean, before you go production, throw in a sort index and see if it changes, because in some cases, pandas without your knowledge will have a, a join operation or a way to do the comparison that you don't know is there, but that can take advantage of that. Uh, there's a hand at the back of the room. Yes. The intuitional performance is that uh, when you do the equals equals, you are asking explicitly four million questions. So if you say, um, 
c.title equals sleuth. Um, this is explicitly 4 million questions, and pandas, because it can't see what the rest of the expression is, it's just an object being asked by Python to do this operation, it is going to have to make 4 million trues and falses as your answer. Uh, when I do this, uh, it just says, all right, um, middle of this uh, list is M, so let's move to the right. I'm now in the T's, let's move to the left. And typically, in, uh, in this case, in about 30 steps, it will be all the way down to um, sleuth. It t t because two to the 10th is about 1,000, and because it's splitting the problem in half with each step, it takes about 10 steps to get a thousand things narrowed down to one. And so typically for every uh, power of 10 involved, it, it takes, uh, sorry, for every power of a thousand involved, it takes about 10 steps for, for uh, 1,024 uh, uh, possibilities to be narrowed down. So in this case, for a million, I would expect, let's see, a million is a thousand thousands, so I'd expect about 20 steps to go from four million to four, and then another step or two for it to find where that ends. Where, where, where the, because it, once it finds where these sleuths start, it has to find where these sleuth rows end. All right, always um, put, uh, so, so I will defer for the moment further questions about performance and just say make sure that you time things. And the IPython notebook makes these experiments so simple by uh, giving us this wonderful uh, percent percent time. Uh, but I am, for the moment, going to now turn to other interesting things uh, to power a last few exercises that we're going to do here. Uh, because in most of the problems I see people solve, they are not manually building indexes by set index and sort index. Again, that's a case uh, that you do uh, run into when you want to have an app that comes up, loads up some data, and can now answer questions very quickly about hundreds of movies. But I very often see people get data frames with interesting indexes by a quite different operation that throws data out. And it is called group by. It operates like this. Let's get the cast menu. Let us uh, narrow our attention to George Clooney. So here he is, George Clooney in a number of movies. And what I am going to do here is I am going to ask pandas to get these rows and group together similar rows by paying attention, let's say, to the title, the year, and the character name within that title and year. And here I'm setting up a hierarchical inde index, just as we saw before. Title will be first, year will be next, and character will be third. And because group by, its goal is to get a whole section of your data and aggregate it together somehow. The simplest of those operations that you can do, you have to choose one of them. Simply doing a group by gives you a group by object ready to do the grouping and it doesn't know what you want to do until you tell it. Size simply tells you the number of rows that uh, matched for a particular title, year, and character. So I can, I'm gonna bump the font size down just for a moment. Uh, apologize to those of you sitting in the back, but uh, I want this to format correctly. Title, year, and character. Now, what we've gotten out here is, is, is what is this thing called? This ugly thing without my pretty CSS around it? Series. It's a series. Oh, I always feel terrible when I see a series. But here it is. Um, in this case, there is no, by definition, title, year, and character combination that could appear twice for George Clooney. So size is just spit out one for all of them. But look at the structure of this index. It has first automatically sorted this index by title, sorted it next by year, and then by character. So notice George Clooney is sometimes credited more than once for the same movie. He played 
spoiler, <laughs> both Batman and Bruce Wayne in the movie Batman and Robin. I hope that that doesn't, doesn't, isn't too big a spoiler. Um, this isn't a spoiler because I have no idea who Jack and Edward even are in the American. Uh, but you can see that this has created a hierarchical index. If you play later, you can use .loc to step in, grab a particular title or a title in year in order to get smaller pieces of it. Now, it's not necessary for you to pull that much information out. You can do things like just pull the title in year. Now we have no way to distinguish the two pieces of data from Batman and Robin, so dot size simply returned two. You can do just a group by year and see how many films he's in, uh, each of the decades in which he's been uh, operating, and we can then run plot in order to see the number of roles that he's had each year. That's kind of ugly. I think a bar graph makes more sense uh, to show number of roles per year. Uh, I should note that when we did this other plot, Pandas has this bad habit of even though numbers start with zero, it like will, to save space on the page, it'll often start with the lowest number one in the data set. So you can say, let's set a Y limit of zero to make it show us that the graphs, uh, or that, 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 that these um, rows here are not showing us nothing, they're showing us a quantity of one. It's not all the way down to, the, to nothingness, to zero. It's often an important thing to do if you want a graph to be understandable. Um, then what I, uh, yes. Now that was horrible. Uh, I, I, actually, I would change to, I don't remember the symbol for it, uh, but I would change to actually putting dots there if I were really going to put this in front of uh, um, uh, someone using my data to make decisions. For the moment, I'm just illustrating. I'm not trying to be that pretty. But I think you're right that it doesn't necessarily make sense to connect this data with lines because, you know, if you play at one role in 1980 and your next role in 1990, there is no sense in which you're kind of in a series of halfway roles in between. So good point about the data um, display here. The, um, there are other things that you can do, by the way, besides size. Here, we're showing um, the uh, simply asking, how many rows are there for each year uh, in this data frame? How many times does 2010 appear? You can also do other things. Like I can ask, hey, for the row in, what's the maximum value that it takes? Which, remember, is the worst row role because it's, it's, it's worse to have a big number as you're in. It's best to have one as your number in. So we can see that in 2001, George Clooney was the 36th most important actor in some movie or other. If we change this to men, then we can say that that same year he had a leading role in some other movie. You see where group by is going to get all of the rows for 1999 and smush them together using whatever form of aggregation we have here. This is the minimum value of all of those 99 roles. Uh, this is the maximum value for all of those 99. And if you become a data scientist, you'll learn about all of these other things you can do, like averages, standard deviations, all of the kinds of numbers operations you can think of. For the moment, for most of our uh, operations that we do here, I'm just going to stick with size. Uh, so if I wanted to know, finally, how many times he has been in, uh, how, many, how many films he's done each decade, I have a problem because this original data frame doesn't have a decade column. Well, that's okay. You don't have to group by a named column like this. You can group by any series, even one that's not part of the data frame and that you just come up with on the spur of the moment. If we get the year and divide by 10, then we now get everything sorted by uh, decade. It looks a little weird, so we'll multiply that by 10. 
there. In this case, we got c dot year, which is a series, divided all of them by 10 to remove the last digit, multiplied by 10 to put that digit back as a zero, and ask the group by to group by something that wasn't even in the table. Decade isn't in the table. We're just inventing a series the same height as the table and using it to do the group by. So one of the great things about pandas is that you can make, it, which is exactly what we've been doing each time we've done filtering. This creates a kind of throwaway column. We could call it the George Clooney column. That is, uh, an, uh, we don't give it a name. We never went and added it back to the data frame as a George Clooney column stuck on the end of all the others. But it is a series, just like the ones named in the data frame are series. It's a series that we're inventing, using, and throwing away without ever feeling the name, uh, without ever feeling the need to add it to the data frame itself where we could see it or have it be a permanent part of it. Uh, and this expression is the same kind of thing. So um, that is a very, very, very frequent and common operation. And if you would like to try it once or twice, open exercises three. We have a few minutes here for you to try a first few of those. I'll circulate and help anyone out. And then again, I'll leave uh, most of those uh, exercises for you to do later. And I'll come up and keep talking. So get started and see if you can do at least one group by. I'll be there in a second. Apparently, even though I tried to be consistent and uh, always put movie titles in parenthesis with correct uh, capitalization, I apparently forgot the double quotes around the Pink Panther. And so if you look up the movie Pink Panther, it does not exist because no one has ever made a movie with that name. It is the Pink Panther that is the movie. While I'm up here and talking, I'm going to go ahead and tackle our, uh, 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 the subject of our fourth section. Uh, you'll note that as we're going along, sessions have fewer problems in them, but more complicated ones. Because whereas that first session had quick little problems that you could often just spin up answers to immediately, I hope you're finding that th th these later sessions are requiring more exploration. You try stepping one direction, maybe back, step another direction, and that you might find they're requiring more exploration in order to get the data set up. And for that reason, I provided fewer but uh, more interesting questions in each session as we go along. I would like briefly to look at one of the problems um, that was posed in uh, session three. We... Um, sometimes pull data, rows of data, that we want to compare. And one of the examples, uh, which I believe was in session three, uh, was the example of actors and actresses and how many roles there are that are uh, prepared for actors and pre prepared for actresses in uh, film. And if I recall, that happened by um, getting the cast uh, looking at the dot type. And, and, you know, we can do things like um, let's do a group by, and I'll do my favorite little um, year divided by 10 times 10, and um, the type. So we're going to get the type grouped by decade. It's going to give me a horrible error because what did I forget to do? Exactly. Unfortunately, the second argument to group by is the axis. And it's like, I don't know what axis type is. And the uh, problem is that if I wanted to have several uh, columns named, I have to put them in square brackets. Uh, and so let's get, say, the size. So here we have, by decade, the number of credits for actors and actresses. 
And sometimes we want to look at this and we'd like to be able to compare those two numbers. Maybe we're interested in comparing the eight to the two, or we're interested in comparing the 78 to the 24. And it's not easy to do that when they're stacked up vertically. I will not say impossible. In pandas, nothing is impossible. But it's really difficult. If you, if, if, this, if, if, if you get to this point and you want to compare the actor and actress number, you wind up in a kind of difficult situation where you have to like get maybe some odd index integer numbers and some even numbers and then try to, it, 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 it can be really complicated. Now, I've seen people get really tangled up trying to get the odds and the evens um, or even more complicated situations compared when they keep things vertical. And so, we'll do the following illustration to show you that that's not how data scientists think of this. They don't go into this thinking, well, I need to get all the odd number uh, entries and compare them to the even ones. They do what is maybe my very favorite operation, the unstack operation. Let's say that we want to compare how Kermit the Frog and Oscar the Grouch have been doing through movie history. Which has rated higher? Which more often gets to be a lead role? Get a shot at the Oscar by being the lead. Well, first what we would want to do is, um, and I'll cut and paste so you don't have to watch me type it, uh, we would simply want to get uh, all of the rows out of our data set where the character name is Kermit the Frog, that's his last name, or Oscar the Grouch. And if we hit enter, let's see if that looks reasonable. It does, and we're getting a uh, number of rows. I mean, did head, so it's only five, where Jim Henson is being Kermit the Frog. I actually want to know if I spelled Oscar the Grouch correctly, so I will take dot head off so that we see everything. Yeah, there are some Oscar the Grouches in here. And... We might want to plot Kermit and Oscar differently. We might want to compare the numbers. And the problem is that group by will only get us so far. We can ask to group uh, by the character, and we can see Kermit the Frog has appeared in nine films, Oscar the Grouch in only three. Uh, and if we're interested in, um, per decade, how many films they've featured in, we can do my favorite little maneuver that turns years into decades. Now we have two levels. We have a uh, uh, character, and then for each character, the decades. But there's a problem here, isn't there? If I want to compare, I somehow need to get Kermit's 1980 number next to Oscar the Grouches. And that magnificent operation is called unstack. So far, in all of the operations we have done, we have been concerned with the data frame itself, the area in blue, and the index over here to the left. We have sometimes had a very simple index of integers. We sometimes have had a complicated multi-index of several levels of mixed string and integer data. But to this moment, we've never really done anything with the top. But I draw your attention to the fact that it is pink as well. It is also an index. I've been talking this whole time to keep things simple as though each data frame has an index. In fact, it has two. Both of the pink things here are an index. One runs along the top and lets you talk about columns. The other runs along the side and lets you talk about rows. We already have seen how to shovel data horizontally from our data columns into the index and back. What were those methods called? Set index and reset index. The operations that go vertically are called unstack and I always remember this by the fact that unstack starts with the letter U. So which direction do you think it moves in? Up. Stack moves data down 
to the left index, unstack will move it up. So watch this. We will come down to this series. No, this series. That is Kermit the Frog, Oster the Grouch. And if I run unstack, then I get uh, absolute nonsense. Because, huh? Because I'm attempting to unstack this. And uh, what it's doing is it is faithfully moving um, the, uh, all of the columns upwards and making a mess. Yes, thank you. What I meant to do here was not just to do the group by, and then let's give that a different name. I'll use G as my little abbreviation for my group by. All right, here we go. I often confuse my, this by the way is an important thing to see happen. This is normal. You always will be getting a confusing result, backing up and realizing you're operating on the wrong data frame. So always be prepared, because I do that all the time in real work. So be prepared to back up, take a deep breath, and to look at what you're about to unstack. What I wanted to unstack was this. And here we go. Unstack, by default, tackles the innermost level of the index. This isn't what I wanted. I did not want the years to pop up to the top. So it takes an optional argument, which again, by default, is going to be the uh, first um, index. Think of this as a tuple, where this is element 0, and this is element 1. By default, it's going to take the innermost one. But by providing a non-default value for that second argument, for, sorry, for that first argument, I can draw its attention somewhere else. So here I've told it, I don't want the years along the top, though again, that's perfectly possible, and you might have reasons for wanting to do that. I would rather have the names, this uh, zero indexed element of each part of the um, index moved up on top. And this is absolute magic, because whereas in this data frame, I'm not sure how I would have compared the number four stuck up here with the number one stuck down here. I'm not sure how I would have compared the 1990 value of two with this 1990 value of one. But once I've done the unstack, they're right next to each other. And this is how you can get data that is widely separated and switch so that, uh, like, uh, so, so that Kermit's data and Oscar's data are right next to each other. And I'll call uh, that U, and I'll keep it on the screen. And now we can do magic things, like we can say, well, how many more times each decade does Kermit the Frog appear in film compared to Oscar the Grouch? So I can say, let's get the Kermit the Frog column. Notice I have to use the square brackets and quotes because there are spaces in this column name, so I can't use, uh, I can't say dot Kermit the Frog because there would be spaces in it. And so I'm going to get the Kermit the Frog value, subtract the Oscar the Grouch column, and see nothing on the screen because I forgot to, okay, because it's, build this, and then I'll, um, let's not overwrite the, the U data frame. Let's just do the subtraction, display it to the screen, and we can now see that the world has been worsening these last three decades. We went from a decade where Kermit appearances outnumbered Oscar appearances by three to a rather sadder and more difficult decade where uh, out only outnumbered by one, to the rather troubling decade of the 2000s, where Oscar has now pulled even with Kermit for the number of appearances in films. I don't know what the 2010s are going to be like, but we could be in the trash can, if you know what I mean. Now, so first, notice how an unstack lets me bring, uh, lets me get data that is vertically far apart and set it right next to each other by pivoting index information upstairs. By the way, there is an opposite um, 
uh, as I promised, there is something, if, if we get u here, uh, doing stack goes back the other way. And so a stack pulls the year right back down, interestingly enough, because I pulled it out out of order. It's, uh, I now have this uh, the other way with year first and character next. If you look at the options to stack, you can actually choose where to shove, where in the index, at what level, to shove the data you're pulling down. Uh, but stack and unstack are reciprocal operations. Uh, here, I'll show you that if you um, take the default of letting the innermost uh, data be put upstairs, then when you pull it back down, you get exactly the same data frame back. The, um, uh, there's two caveats that I need to make here before you try using this yourself. First, you can see that uh, even though the 70s were a happy decade, defined as more Kermit appearances than Oscar appearances, I'm not able to see that in my data frame down here, in my result, because Oscar didn't appear at all. And when I asked for that uh, pivot to take place, for the unstacking operation to make two new columns, it looked in this original data source, and it just it, it says, I don't know. I don't know how many times. I don't know what value to put here for Oscar the Grouch because there is simply not a data row I possess to fill in a 1970 value. Um, uh, this is a very, very important feature of pandas, and one reason it's very renowned, because if you're working with financial data or things like that, you don't want zeros to appear magically when you do an unstack, because the stock market's value wasn't zero on a Saturday because you happen to have a Saturday in your data, right? It's an unknown. And so, by default, pandas shows you your missing data as these not a number gaps, which lets you then be explicit and choose how they're filled in. For that reason, there is a fill not a number um, method that lets you set it equal to anything you want, like 100 or 0, 10, hey. You know, you can, you can set it to whatever you want. I sometimes do this. I sometimes, just to see my data frame, do a fill in A with a blank string so that I simply see blanks there, so especially if my data frame's full of text. The NANs, I'm like, well, is that the text NAN or is that a not a number value? And doing a fill in A of blank can be helpful. In this case, I'm going to fill with zero because for an entry to be missing in this particular group by means no rows that year, zero rows that year. And so by doing that, I can come down and correctly see that 1970 was a good decade, and that 2010 is looking to be pretty good as well, at least so far. So one caveat is to be prepared to handle missing data when you do an unstack, and know that fill-in-A operation so that you can provide for that. The other danger is that it makes absolutely no sense. Or let's say it, it can be very, very confusing if you do one too many unstacks. So here, and in fact, this is quite dire. This had me convinced for several months that I just didn't understand group by. Uh, 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 understand, I'm sorry, it had me convinced I didn't understand unstack. Because I thought, okay, unstack sends the data which direction? And so I said, let's unstack character. Oh, it went up. And I thought, okay, I think I get it. Let's, and then fatally, I said, well, doing it once was awesome. Doing it again will be even better. Ah! <laughs> and I was appalled because it had instead apparently moved the data down, right? The years have now come back. And I kind of wish that pandas didn't do this. Uh, I wish that pandas had if you do a final unstack, and there's actually a way, I, I, there's a, you can make it uh, uh, do a, uh, keep, keep, ever, keep a data frame. 
The problem is this. Pandas always tries to return the simplest thing it can because that keeps data scientists sane. By definition, a data frame has two indexes. In the colors I've used here, um, kind of a, the pink manila color along the top, the manila color along the side. To have a data frame, to have two dimensions, you got to have some categories along the top, you've got to have categories going down. Panda's rule is if you do enough unstacks or enough stacks that you just finally have clobbered and wiped out one or the other index, it just gives you a series because you no longer have two dimensions. So here, from this output, I can go either direction and just get a series. If I unstack the year, then it's going to move, in, in, in its mind, it's going to move the year up and then be like, oh, I have nothing on the left. I don't have anything to put on the left anymore. And so confusingly enough to my eyes, even though, it, even though these are my old column labels, it's simply returning them as a series index. Interestingly enough, that is exactly the same thing that will happen if I dot stack here. Uh, if I call dot stack to let the character come down, I also get a series. And this kept me so confused. Uh, the rule is that you can get a series either by moving too much stuff upstairs or by moving too much stuff downstairs. If you want, you can save yourself from that situation by just adding a little more to your index. One thing that I can do here is I can get my, and it, we won't do this in any exercises, but I could get this little data frame. I could just make an extra column like this. Um, wait, what did that do? G, oh, I'm sorry. I meant to, um, let me rebuild G now that I've added a column to it. Come up here, rebuild the G data frame. And what I meant to do was assign a uh, name to this little data frame, not to modify G itself. I wanted to modify what we were looking at. This is my data frame. I'm going to create a new column called extra. It just has the number one. I am then going to, um, now that I've set that, I'm going to say data frame, move that over to the index, and nothing happened because I forgot to assign. And though normally set index clobbers and removes the index you've worked so hard to put there, set index does have a drop option. I can say, you know, let's do a set index, but not clobber and replace the index that's there. Let's just, I'm sorry, it's not drop, it is append. Drop is whether you remove the column from the right. I am happy to see extra dropped from over here because that wasn't why I put it there. Um, what I mean is please do append it to the existing indexes. So I went from this data frame to moving extra over as a special supplement, a special extra column, so that now when I do my second unstack, it doesn't, I'm sorry, and let's unstack the years. I now have a name. I now have a level of indexing that can survive that <coughs> final um, unstack and convince us that unstack does go upwards. Unstack does go up. The U in unstack points that direction uh, and stacking comes back down. It will fool you. Because again, if you manage to wipe out your entire index and be left with nothing on that left-hand side, it will return a series that displays vertically on your page. And if you're me, you'll be very confused and thinking, but unstack went the other way. Uh, and the, uh, if you, the, the rule I follow is that if I don't want to be confused, I never let this left index finally be completely emptied. 
uh, unless I'm prepared to think through, okay, I, have a, I guess I have a series now. So unstack lets you move data up, stack lets you move it back down. And with uh, that knowledge, you now kind of know your way around the whole data frame. You can move data left and right with set index and uh, reset index in order to move columns over. And then you can move uh, unstack and stack in order to pivot information once you have a rich and interesting index on the left-hand side. Unstack will let you move it up to the top so that you can compare Kermit the Frog and Oscar the Grouch each decade. So we have about five minutes here for me to, uh, having explained all that, for me to set you guys loose on the sec uh, session four exercises. So we'll do that to the top of the hour, and then uh, I'll get back up here and, and probably do session five and six all by myself without a further break, and you guys will do the exercises when uh, you get home or later in the conference. So get going. I'll walk around and answer questions you might have, and we'll get started up again with the uh, tutorial in five minutes. Yeah, have been seeing good things on your screens, and it's getting close to time that I finish things out by illustrating a last few concepts. First, I am going to actually come in and, for about a minute each, tackle the last few exercises uh, in, in Exercises 4, because it's really here at the end of exercises four, that I think we see the real full power of, of pandas, and that I really feel like, it's once I learn unstack, that I really start to feel like there's a whole world of questions I can answer. Because everything else keeps, uh, so, sort of, you can, with set index and reset index, you can sort of shuffle data left and right, but again, there's no good way to compare unlike things until you finally learn unstack. And that, for me, is what really breaks things free where I can do interesting comparisons. So let me just quickly uh, plot the difference between the number of actor roles each year and the number of actress roles each year over the history of film. I always, as I've said, start by glancing at the, oh, I opened a new notebook, so. I had better read all of this data in so that I have something called cast. And come to think of it, I'd probably, oh, no, no, it was a, I think there's, I was about to add a bunch of rows at the bottom, but I think I'm fine. So this is what cast looks like. And I guess what I want to do is look at, um, do a group by on um, year of the, um, no, year and type which you need square brackets around it. So I need a two-level index, because if I just do uh, year dot size, that's not enough. I also need the type of role that it was. Here we are, actors and actresses through the years. Plot the difference between the difference. Oh, this is one of those problems where I need unlike things next to each other, because I can only subtract if I have one piece of data in one column and another piece of data in another. So that is the signal that I should probably do um, an unstack in order to create columns. If we unstack on type, then I have actor and actress right next to each other where I can, for instance, um, get actor. Uh, so if I want the difference, I would do actor uh, minus actress. And that gives me, just as it should, a list of years that each have a number assigned to them in this series. So I can plot, and I'm done with that. So this is the sheer number uh, by which the number of slots available in movies for actors exceeded actresses, but there's not much context here. Like, is 40,000 a big number, or is it a small number? Well, I don't know. It depends on how many movies, uh, uh, movie characters there were total that year. Right? I mean, this number goes up over time, presumably just because the number of roles available increases. So I'm going to hit notice inside a cell, Control-A, uh, which normally in your browser, whoops, 
is a scary thing to hit because normally it selects, ah, oh, the whole document, but inside a cell they've overridden control A to just grab all, to uh, uh, select all. That's a great thing to learn because you spend a lot of your life clicking and dragging if you don't know control A. So select all, come down. So I can start with this when I now answer, plot the fraction of rolls. All right, what I would want to do here is instead of subtracting, I would want to get actors over the total, which you get by adding. So here, I'm first adding the number of actor roles to the number of actors to get a total. Then I'm figuring out what fraction of those are actor roles. And so now I'm getting a number that looks like it moves around a lot because to try to make the graph interesting, um, the grapher, the graphing algorithm has, has chosen to clip it at 0.6 and 0.9, and we really, I think, expect a ratio to go from 0 to 1. So let me uh, artificially set the bottom as 1 and the uh, bottom as 0, the top as 1. So this would be if all roles were uh, actresses. This would be if all roles were actors. And so now we have some context. Even though the number of male roles has been going up, the ratio has actually been trending downward because the number of roles has been growing faster than the number of actor roles since about 1940, which is when it peaked. And again, notice the number of series that are getting created and then thrown away as intermediate values here. Uh, plot the fraction of supporting roles, control A, control C, control V for select all, copy and paste. Supporting roles means that before doing anything on this, I want to limit myself to the n equals two roles only. And this is interesting because um, supporting roles have been a bit more even through the year. I mean, in fact, given that 0.5 is in the middle here, supporting roles, that n equal two slot, has, has been kind of holding steady over the decades. That's as likely to be occupied by an actor as an actress. And now for the real fun, how are we going to build a plot with a line for all the ranks one through three where the line shows the fraction? Here I'm going to be interested in, um, we'll do this one little step at a time, we're going to be interested in all of the cases where n is less than or equal to 3. And simply grouping by year and type isn't going to be enough because I not only need to distinguish whether this is actor or actress and the year, I also need to know what its n was. So I'd better not throw that out. Only the things that I include here in the group by like this uh, will become a part of my index. Well, that's better. Now I seem to be preserving, I'm sorry, we don't have uh, quite enough room. Let me toggle the header and toolbar off. Wish there were just a keystroke for that. Um, we now seem to have all the information we need. We know for each year how many actors had the rank one, two, and three, how many actresses had the rank one, two, and three. And so build a plot with a line where the line shows the fraction. All right, so I am going to need to first unstack the type, just as I did before, because only by pivoting actor and actress up to the top can I compare them. Next, I am going to want to do the same maneuver I did before, where I get the total number, actor plus actress, and then figure out what fraction actor is uh, of that total. And I'm getting out now a series of numbers. Those look, they're all between zero and one. It looks like that worked. But because I have a three level index, my unstack left me with two remaining. And what I want now is I want all of the ones to be in a column so that it gets a line on the graph, all of the twos to be a column, and all of the threes. So, you guessed it, I need a second unstack to bring the ones, the twos, and the threes up to the top so that I have that ratio separately and can see that leading roles, the blue, n equals one, um, 
have, have hovered through most of film history at about three quarters of the roles being actors, that in equal two has stayed fairly even, in, staying in between uh, 40 and 60% over the history of film, and that that third slot started out being three quarters uh, actor roles and has slowly moved down to about 60% over time. This is the kind of example where we see unstacking working at full power, where I wanted to get a, 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 a statistic built out of two pieces of data, so I had to unstack and do some math, that I then wanted aggregated by yet another piece of data, so I had to unstack again. And this is how you do really interesting operations where there's two or three different labels breaking your data up that you need to pull off one at a time in order to do your aggregation. I saw a hand up. Uh, I couldn't because uh, in order to make this ratio, I, 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 only, I can only have, I would have to do it like three times. If I broke, if I did all the unstacking at once, I then would have to do this exact same operation three times. And I wanted to avoid that. So I wanted to go ahead and just do this example in front of you because this shows pandas really operating at full power. Um, and now, let me very quickly do uh, just the brief intro to session five and session six so that you can tackle those problems later having uh, seen the basic maneuvers. Because I knew we would be exhausted here at the end. Session uh, five doesn't have much in it. In fact, it basically has two things. The first is very simple. Um, if I open my Exercises 5 um, notebook, just right here, it loads up a somewhat different set of tables than before. It draws your attention to a table we haven't seen yet called release dates. And this was kind of a ploy on my own part in order to get some practice with dates. That's what most people who use pandas are interested in. Um, so if I say, let's grab our release dates and just look at the dot head. You'll note that there is, um, the date is a single thing. It's a single kind of information that Panda, Pandas understands as a single quantity. When we wanted to get at strings using string-like operations, what did we do? Dot str to reach into this extra namespace of functions and, and attributes and methods that uh, pandas had ready for us. If you want to do date time operations, then it is called DT. So I can say, yeah, yeah, I know that it's a date. Just give me the year. And it's telling me a data frame doesn't have a DT. Only series have a DT. I forgot. I can't ask the year. For its, uh, I can't ask the title for its year or the country. There isn't a year here. I have to reach into r dot date, draw my attention to the series before I can say, "Hey, let's look at the year. Let's look at the month. Let's look at the day. Let's look at the day of the month. I'm um, sorry. Let's look at the day of the year. Sorry, just day by itself is the day of the month. Day of the year. You can even do day of week." And as you do the exercises, you'll have all kinds of fun finding out that Judy Dench's films might be released at any time of year. Tom Cruise pretty much comes out in the summer. You do that by looking at dot month. You'll see that um, romantic comedies are likely to come out any time of week, but movies with the name action in their title, always on Friday. And those are the kind of things you'll be able to do with this little .dt trick. The big operation, then, that is involved in um, session five is the idea of the merge. And this happens when you have two tables that, uh, uh, where, where you get a selection of rows 
that are then going to help you go to another table and pull interesting data. Two quick examples will illustrate. First, let's grab the cast table that we're all familiar with by now. Let us ask for every movie which uh, Ellen Page has been in. And so there we are. We are uh, getting all of her roles back. What if we're interested in the release dates of those roles? This table doesn't have release dates. The release dates um, are sitting over here in this other table. Well, what we can do is we can say, pandas, please give me the rows of this C data frame I've just built merged with the release dates. And it is going to get every single row of the Ellen Page table. And, and it, it, here it was able to, it, it, it looked and just said, well, how am I going to know which row in release dates matches? And it went through the column names looking for similar ones. Well, OK, title. Oh, there's a title in the release date. Year. There's a year in release dates. And what it just did is it automatically figured out that those column names matched and went into the release dates to find the ones where the title and year was the same. Now, that doesn't always work, and merge has extra keyword arguments you can give it if you want to tell it which columns to match on. But by default, it did the right thing here, and we now have for RoboDog, um, oh, it's a future movie, and we have the projected release dates in at least two countries at this point for the movie The East. Uh, we now have her role appearing many times in this table because we've merged the one row that stated her um, role here with all of the rows uh, stating a country and a release date. So the other uh, uh, exercises, that in exercises five, have you do these kinds of merges to find out when people's movies uh, tend to be released. Um, there are, uh, you'll see a lot of other operations with similar names, but the, uh, like a join, and you might be confused, what's the difference between a join and a merge? Um, and, and, and pandas seems over time, uh, because people get tired, let's say, of typing merge over and over again, maybe with a, a, a given set of options. So finally, they'll add a join method that pretty much is just a merge, but with like different defaults. Uh, merge is the most general. Merge is, I believe, the oldest or one of the oldest. I recommend just using merge. Um, to do all of your putting to together of related da uh, data from different tables. And only when you're really, really comfortable with merge, maybe dabble in join or some of the other operations that you can do um, uh, in order to, 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 um, uh, to get really, really good at one method before you move on to the others. The, um, I should mention, just because it always seems to come up, um, there is such a thing as a pivot operation. I will do one here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get the release dates. I'm going to ask for everything that starts with Star Wars colon episode. And just to keep the results fitting on the screen, let's grab also from that release dates only the countries that start with you. And what pivot does is it does a set index, a sort index, and a what operation to get the information upstairs? Unstack. Uh, data uh, people are always wanting to do those three operations all in a row, set index, sort index, and unstack in order to, for instance here, get title on the left, country on the top, date as the sort of chewy center. And that's such a frequent operation that there is this special pivot maneuver that lets you build uh, index on uh, bottom, index along the top, data in the middle. But it only works in that one circumstance. And that's why we didn't practice it here. Because if you know uh, set index, sort index, and unstack, you can do the same thing and can do things that pivot cannot. Or does it not make sense? 
R is the um, huh. R is the um, has the same. We haven't changed its structure. All we've done is this is a pair of filtering operations. So it's just a title, year, country, and date for um, the release dates of all of the Star Wars films in countries beginning with you. So initially, the index is useless. It's just the line number of the CSV file we read in. Um, and what we're doing here is we're pivoting the countries up to the top, uh, the titles over to the left, and leaving the dates as the information in the center. We're just about at the end of our time, so I will do, um, well, two more quick maneuvers. First, I will, um, and, and, and I, you'll, you'll have this in your notes, but I will just put on the screen here the fact that you can merge a table with itself. Let's build a table of all of Cary Grant's movies. Title year, Cary Grant was in it in some role. You now might think, well, who does Cary Grant tend to co-star with? Who tends to be in Cary Grant movies? Okay, well, that would be in the table we just looked at, in the characters table. So in the case of wanting to release date, we pull some interesting movies, and we want to merge with release date to bring those release dates in next to Ellen Page's movies. Here, we've selected out of the cast table some interesting Cary Grant movies. If we want to know the co-stars, those are also in this table. And so, we're in the interesting situation where we want to do a merge of a table with itself, where we might say, hey, this little uh, table, let's merge you back with the main cast table on the title and year. So this only has Houseboat 1958 once. We're going to go re-ask the cast table for every row that says Houseboat 1958. And just to keep things simple, we'll only ask for leading and supporting actors. And so what we get out is every single movie that, um, oh, oh and, and when you do a merge, it, uh, all of the columns from the left-hand side, if it's the same table with itself, it has to keep up with the tables from the left and the table from the right-hand side. Because if it's the same table, all the column names are going to overlap and try to collide with each other. So it puts X at the ends of some of the names, Y at the end of others. There's a keyword argument if you want something besides X and Y. But so we now have Houseboat 1958 had Cary Grant in it, and it had Cary Grant in it. How, Houseboat 1958 had Sophia Laura, Lauren. And as we go down, you'll see that what it's figured out is that Cary Grant is always, invariably, in every Cary Grant movie. It's amazing. And this always happens when you join a table with itself. It doesn't know what you're trying to do. So it's happy to say that not only is Cary Grant in uh, the movie with Myrna Loy, but he's also in that exact same movie with himself. So what you need to do is, once you do the join, you need to tell it, I don't want the right-hand name to also be Cary Grant. Please make the right-hand name anything but Cary Grant so that we don't get uh, all of his rows twice. Now we have Cary Grant um, paired with um, Sophia Loren a lot. which confuses me, because I thought we would only get him once. Let's uh, change this to, ah, I pasted something wrong. Cannot redimension. All right, I'll leave this here. I'll uh, finish this up and put it on the web, that you can merge a table with itself if you want the um, uh, to go back into the table to find all of the rows that in some way match the rows that you've just started with. And my mouse isn't moving. I'm running low on RAM. 
it's obviously almost time to finish. The uh, final exercise you'll see in session six lets you practice some data cleaning. I will show you one maneuver from there if I can regain control of my computer. It'll take one minute and will be worth it because it's a hard maneuver. Right. Shut down, shut down, give me my computer back. At least it's able, I can hear the fan slowing down. We won. <laughs> Here, this is based on what I helped a sci-fi friend do. He's an author and he also helps uh, aggregate sales numbers where you're having to get your sci-fi ebooks and sell them over a number of different channels. Some of those channels have reasonable CSV files like this, telling you how many books you sold. Amazon's reports look like this. Um, it, well, first, there's a lot of blanks, which normally come up as not a numbers, but I don't like not a numbers, as I've, I've explained, so I'm replacing those with empty strings to make this easy to look at. The US royalties here, down, they only state the currency at the bottom of each of these weird little blocks of results. Publishing. And they are stupid reports because I want USD next to each of these prices. I want Great Britain pounds next to each of these prices. Let me just give you a glimpse of what you'll do as you complete this exercise, well worth doing on your own. What you will do is you will get sales too. You will stare at it in horror as you look at these first 10 lines and think, how on earth am I going to get this up? And if you play around a lot, I think you will find the following idea. Let me give myself a little room so we don't get bounced around as I write one last line of pandas for you. If we look at sales too, we can get, oh, I have my notes over here, of course. What we want to do is we want to figure out that this says USD. What we can do is get that first column, which is called title. And if you look at the string operations, there is an extract one, which takes a regular expression where I can tell it, give me any information inside of real parenthesis. Hey, it worked. It's almost impossible to see unless I get these silly NANs out of our way. So it did it. I was able to go into that column and pull out USD from this total. GBD, uh, Great Britain pounds and euros. Problem is that they're still not next to what I need to do. If this is a new column and um, I want to say get this table, sales to, and make a new column called currency and set it equal to this new column and then sales to will just display the whole thing, I have a problem. I have successfully made a new row that recognized the Great Britain pound, Great Britain pounds, that recognized the USD. And the last thing that you will start practicing is the fact that, you, there, that there are other ways to get rid of not a numbers than just saying, you know, fill the NAs with a blank space, fill the NAs with a value zero. There's more creative things you can doing, you can do, like you can say, fill the NAs by doing a forward fill. Forward fill means get these stock market prices, and where I have blanks, just move the last value forward in time. So here, USD not only occupies its own slot, but is now copied downward through all of these uh, values that were empty. Great Britain pounds is copied downward. Now that's the opposite, more or less, of what we wanted. Let's, by the way, just do it to this column rather than to everything. This is the opposite of what we wanted because this is a total at the bottom of all of the rows. Forward fill went down, guess what goes up? Backward fill. And that's the solution. I have pulled out those currency names. I have then 
filled them upward from every cell with a value up into the previous not a numbers to fill it in. And if you now go in and select the rows that are only real book prices, and I'll leave you to figure out how to do that, you will have the correct currency sitting next to every one. This is a real world problem that I spent a weekend helping a friend solve, the, the problem of getting all this data aggregated. And it will uh, be a really great exercise for you to do. Always keep the pandas documentation at your elbow and be free to look for things that you haven't used yet or learned. But you'll find that what we've done in this course, sorting, head, tail, value counts, setting an index, sorting it, stacking and unstacking will usually get you 99% of the way to getting typical data problems solved. Thank you guys very much for your patience.